Uh, good evening. My name is Dr. Matt Killingsworth. I'm a senior lecturer here in uh, International Relations in the School of Social Sciences. Um, and it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you all to the 10th Sir James Plimsoll Lecture. Uh, this year's speaker is His, His Excellency Dr. Michael Push, uh, the EU Ambassador to Australia, and he will be speaking on the topic of Closer Ties, a game-changing year for EU-Australia relations. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, uh, Alderman Dr. Peter Sexton, the Hobarts of the Hobart City Council, Mr. Bob Gordon, the Honorary Council of Finland, Mr. Ed Kremsher, the Honorary Council of Poland, Mr. Frank McGregor, the, honor the Honorary Consul of the United Kingdom, um, Member of the Tasmanian Executive of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and National Chief Executive Bryce Wakefield, um, State Director of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Ms. Harriet Bailey, and of course, and perhaps most importantly, the niece of Sir James, Kathleen Plimsoll, um, and she's joined this evening by Tony and Christian. It's also important that as a reflection of this institution's recognition of the deep history and culture of this island, the University of Tasmania wishes to acknowledge the Muanina and Palawa peoples, the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which this campus was built, and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. I'd now like to welcome Professor uh, Peter Boyce um, to the lectern to um, introduce the concept of the Sir James Plimsoll Lecture. Professor Boyce. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished Australian diplomat in whose memory our annual Plimsoll lectures are delivered has frequently been described, and not just by his biographer, as the most impressive diplomat in the annals of Australian international relations. 20 years after his death in 1987, the Department of Foreign Affairs the University of Tasmania and the Australian Institute of International Affairs agreed to jointly host an annual lecture in Hobart, not, as some DFAT personnel would have preferred, in Canberra. The first Plimsoll lecturer was Alexander Downer, Foreign Minister for 11 years and earlier in his career, third secretary in our Brussels EU mission, then headed by Plimsoll. Regular attendees will have heard summaries of Plimsoll's public service, but a few characteristics of his career are probably worthy of repeated mention. An economics graduate of Sydney University in the first year of World War II, Jim Plim, as he was affectionately known, was recruited to a rather strange intelligence research and post-war planning outfit under the direction of a very eccentric fellow named Alf Conlon and in which Plimsoll carried the unlikely rank of major. H.V. Evatt, the External Affairs Minister, persuaded him to join the burgeoning Department of External Affairs in 1948, and he soon saw service in both Japan and Korea, in the Far Eastern Commission on Japan and the UN Commission on Korea following the Korean War. Plimsoll spent 37 years in the Foreign Service, and his eight head of mission appointments included New York, Delhi, Washington, Moscow, Brussels, London, and Tokyo. He served both Labour and coalition governments with equal comfort and non-partisanship, but his final four years were somewhat unhappy because his London appointment as High Commissioner, the first for a career diplomat, was abruptly terminated by Prime Minister Fraser just a few months into his term to make way for one of his less distinguished, that is, Fraser's less distinguished ministerial colleagues. And Plimsoll feared, while subsequently serving in Tokyo, that he might receive similar treatment from Fraser again. He admitted that this experience influenced his acceptance of an offer in 1981 from the Tasmanian Premier, Doug Lowe, to serve as governor of the state. Sir James was both supremely popular and supremely happy in his viceregal role and was looking forward to an extended term at the time of his, of his fatal heart attack in May 1987. Foreign Minister Downer, in his foreword to Jeremy Herder's biography, rightly highlights a few secrets of Plimsoll's effectiveness as a diplomat. 
One was his extraordinary capacity to describe complex issues in simple, clear prose. Another was his tendency to make sensitive and accurate political judgments. A third was his inveterate networking. And a fourth was the respect he earned as a mentor to young officers in his department. In some respects, he would not have been a predictable success. He was unmarried. He didn't play golf. Indeed, he played no sport at all. He was teetotal and he was a very untidy dresser. But he was a convivial host and conversationalist, unusually well read in English literature and history. While ambassador in Moscow during a dark phase of the Cold War, he was invited to give a series of lectures on English literature at Moscow State University and to co-examine a PhD dissertation in that field. We salute Sir James as a supremely successful and popular servant of Australia's national interests during a very long professional career. And I invite the Vice-Chancellor to introduce the 2019 Sir James Plimsoll Lecturer. It is uh, my honour tonight to introduce our speaker, His Excellency Dr Michael Pulch, European Ambassador to Australia. Dr Pulch holds, holds degrees in law and political sciences from the universities of Bonn, Paris and Cambridge. Not only does he speak his native language German, but uh, as his education would suggest, he is also fluent in English, French uh, and Dutch. He began his impressive career in political affairs in the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, serving in the United Nations Directorate before his attachment to the German Embassy in Seoul as a political officer. Dr. Pulch has spent considerable time in Brussels as a deputy head of the European uh, Commission East Asia Division and the US Division of the European Commission, focusing on US foreign and security policy and he is the co-author of the EU's first East Asia policy, uh, policy guidelines. After his assignment uh, in Brussels, uh, he headed to the Russian division uh, in the European External Action Service, uh, and he was the EU ambassador uh, to Singapore. He has many distinctions. Uh, one which caught my attention uh, particularly was his honorary citizenship of the state of Tennessee and the city of Little, Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, so there are clearly many fascinating stories in Dr. Pulcher's life. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to welcome him uh, tonight uh, to give the 10th Sir James Plimsoll Lecture on this uh, uh, topic which could hardly be more important at this time of a game-changing year in EU-Australian relations. Uh, Dr. Pulch. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, many thanks to uh, Vice Chancellor Rufus Black for uh, hosting us here um, and for this very kind introduction. Um, I'm also pleased to acknowledge the participation of the Plimsoll family and, and niece Kathleen Plimsoll and uh, Tony and Chris Sand who are joining us. I was um, uh, very, very um, interested to note that uh, the uh, Sir James uh, had served in Brussels, and that I understand he liked his posting there. Um, that's a good start to this um, lecture here. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm very honored by the invitation to uh, give the 2019 Plimsoll Lecture, and I'm humbled to be part of a, a list of distinguished uh, speakers who had that distinction before me, but I'm also very pleased. I'm, I'm very pleased to be back in Hobart. Um, this is my third time, and uh, uh, we always um, like the welcoming atmosphere here in Tasmania. In fact, my wife Gabriella and, and uh, myself spent uh, parts of our first Australian summer break here. And I think this is the moment where I tell you my favorite Tasmania anecdote. We were in Strawn and uh, introduced to sample um, leatherwood honey and told that this plant, Leatherwood, only exists in Tasmania, and therefore this was a very special product. And I know that my mother liked honey, 
or likes honey, so I decided it was, would be a nice personal gift to bring a jar of honey from Tasmania, which I did. My mother lives in a small town in Germany close to Heidelberg. So I came to her and I said, I'm, I'm traveled all the way from Tasmania and I have this jar of honey. This is from a leatherwood plant and that only exists in Tasmania, so this is a very special product from this place. And um, she was very pleased to receive that. And uh, when, I, when I left a few days later, she said, this, was, this is a fine honey here. And I'm very pleased that you introduced me to it. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll buy it from now on. Luckily, they sell this in our supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> Only shows um, how um, well-known Tasmania has become. And in many ways, it's true, the landscape and the climate in Tasmania reminds us uh, from areas of northern and northwestern Europe, there's a sense of pride for good local food, there's fresh, crisp air, and nicely preserved architecture here in this historical part of Hobart. So I can easily understand why my press officer, Nick Pedley, spent five years here with his family and loved it. And of course, the name of Tasmania marks the visit of a European explorer more than 350 years ago. So we can say there's a European flavor by name and uh, by nature to Tasmania. And since Abel Tasman's time, Europe has and will continue uh, to deepen its ties uh, with this island. And we do this in many ways. Your wine producers are at the forefront of toasting the EU-Australia wine agreement since the sale of Australian wines uh, has tripled um, since we signed it. Uh, we work very closely with the Antarctic Division, only a few minutes down the road. Um, on environmental uh, research um, and protection. And I just met a student here, and there are others, from this campus who participate in the Erasmus Exchange Program that so far has seen a thousand European and Australians to cross the equator to study in a foreign land. So, and we obviously want more Australian students to come to Europe. And why not? You get a, a monthly um, contribution of $900 a month and cover travel expenses. What better can happen to you? Now, today I, I uh, want to talk about a new emerging relationship with Europe and why, in my view, 2019 will become a game changer in EU-Australia relations. Six months ago, uh, I participated in commemorations of the centenary of the uh, World War I armistice and that reminded the Australian people of the sacrifice of the Australian soldiers on European battlefields. The faraway war in Europe became an important part of Australia's own history and nation building. And likewise in Europe, one third of our current member states gained or regained independence as a result of that. And in fact, many formally celebrated one year, 100 years of independence last year. However, that was not the last war on European soil. An even more devastating war should follow only 20 years later. And this experience was the starting point for the new European project, launched in a famous speech on the 9th of May 1950 to break the cycle of uh, conflicts in Europe. So what I would like to cover today are three aspects. EU development, who is your partner? EU-Australia relations, what is happening? And a word on Brexit, why is this relevant? Now, know your partner. In my office, I have a book uh, with the title Europe from War to Peace. It was issued by the Nobel Peace Center. And this book was a present uh, by uh, the first European Council President, Hermann von Rompuy. He received the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the European Union in 2012. There are few organizations who have received this prestigious award, and that I think it makes us all proud to work in the European institutions, that uh, we have been acknowledged for our contribution to the advancement of peace and reconciliation, democracy and human rights in Europe. Two weeks ago in, in Canberra, I uh, planted a linden tree together with my Czech colleague to commemorate uh, the 50th anniversary of the en enlargement to 10 new member states uh, uh, in 2004. Now, the EU is often seen outside Europe as a purely or largely economic undertaking, o uh, overly concerned sometimes with regulations and rule setting. But our roots are much more 
complex. And it's, I think, important to understand where we come from. At the outset, uh, there was a vision, and that vision was to use economic tools to achieve a political objective. In that speech on the 9th of May, the former French Foreign Minister Schumann, um, in his declaration, suggested to bring together, the Euro under a European umbrella, coal and steel production. And that was a very important confidence-building measure, as those were the key resources to produce arms and weapons. Now, how did we arrive where we are today from that starting point? Today, we are one of the largest consumer markets in the world with a GDP of over 17 trillion US dollars, one of the most prosperous regions, a continent once divided by a curtain for half a century, now under one roof. I tell you a story about how this happened and how this looks from a European citizen's perspective, my perspective. As a kid, I grew up close to the Dutch border, and my parents used to go for shopping to the Netherlands from time to time because certain products were cheaper there, particularly coffee and chocolate. And uh, I remember when you went back to, to the drive back to Germany, you had to pass customs controls and passport controls, and everyone got very nervous in the car, um, thinking about that we had bought a few chocolate bars too many. Now, years later, I served in the German Air Force and partly in the Netherlands. And um, we already had a customs union, so there was no problem of bringing along a crate of Dutch beer. And uh, in the mid-1990s, when I joined the European institutions, I brought my family to Brussels. There wasn't any passport controls any, anymore. That step had been taken. But in our entrance hall, we had a cupboard, and that was full of plastic cups of bills and coins. Because if you were living in Brussels at that time, and you were driving one hour around Brussels, you had to pay in a different currency. So just imagine you're on your way to Launceston, and you have to stop halfway, get out of your car, and change your currency. That was how Brussels felt at the time. But between our move to, Brus to Brussels, something happened in Europe, something very extraordinary, that changed the destiny of this continent forever. And I remember that very vividly. I was a young political officer in Germany, in the German embassy in Seoul, when I opened the door to my office on the 10th of November, 1989. It was eight o'clock in the morning and the telephone rang. And on the phone was our honorary consul in Pusan, it's a port in Korea, who's told me, Michael, I'm watching Japanese satellite TV, NHK, and they're showing the wall in Berlin and the wall is coming down. What's happening? Now, for, for, for those who are a bit younger in the audience, this was the time before Twitter and Google and 24 hours of CNN. So I told him, I don't know, let me find out. And I put down the phone, and then I noticed all the phones were ringing in the embassy. And no one could really imagine at the time that this was happening. I myself, my wife, had been to East Germany only 10 weeks earlier. Uh, we had uh, traveled through the country with our vintage Beetle convertible. And th this was, came as a surprise to us. But in the wake of this event, half a million Soviet soldiers, the largest army of battle tanks, an army equipped with nuclear short and medium range missiles, they all left Europe without a single shot fired. And the key priority of the countries to the east was to join the European Union. And they started an enormous transformation process, the biggest we've ever seen. From communism to democracies, from state-run economies to market economies, and from a, a government-controlled environment to personal freedom. Today, today you can travel from Lisbon and Portugal, all across the continent, to the Russian border in Estonia, without ever showing your visa, without showing your passports, and you pay for your gas and the same currency at both ends of the trip. That's how Europe has developed. 
Now, people talk about how China has changed, and I, I was in Beijing for five years as, as DCM, but I would challenge that. I would say no continent has changed as much as Europe has since then. And um, if you want to check this, Google a map of Europe from 1990 and Google a map of Europe from today and do the same with Asia, and you see how that continent has dramatically changed. Now, all the EU institutions have evolved during that process. We started in the late 1950s with only six member countries. Now we span the whole continent, and uh, new members have joined during that process in different stages, and, and interesting enough, for different reasons. The first, the first enlargement was in the 1970s, largely for economic reasons, Ireland, UK, and Denmark. Then in the 1980s, three countries joined, Greece, Spain, Portugal, to preserve democracy after having overcome autocratic military regimes in their own country. A third stage in the 1990s saw neutral, non-aligned countries who wanted to reinforce their um, ties with liberal democracies, Austria, Sweden, and Finland. And the last stage was former socialist communist countries to secure their independence and ensure economic development after the implosion of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. And that happened in stages 2004, 2007, 2013, the largest enlargement of Croatia. Um, so we nearly doubled our membership. And many in the, in the West were also concerned about the structural and organizational challenges that would occur with that. I remember when the, the big enlargement happened, I was posted to Tokyo. And uh, some of my colleagues from the new, then new member states uh, did come to our uh, office building and had a look at our meeting room. And one of them counted the chairs and was very pleased to see that there was enough chairs for everyone to join the new EU institutions here. So that's, that's one of the takeaways I wanted to leave with you, the importance of political dimension for the European project. I think that's key to understand how we, how we work and how we react. And I'll give you three examples. The euro crisis. Now, the euro crisis was actually a sovereign debt crisis. It started in the US, but it was felt mostly in Europe. The market started to bet against the euro in 2011. But the pundits got it wrong. And why did they err? They, I think they just simply underestimated the political determination of European leaders. To defend the euro was not an economic, this was a political decision. And the EU was prepared and to do whatever it takes, as uh, the European Central Bank uh, leader Draghi said. A second example is the Russian reaction to EU enlargements. If you compare that EU enlargement and NATO enlargement, which took place during that same period of time, Russia never had a problem with enlargement, uh, including neighboring countries like Finland, or the Baltic states, or Central and Eastern Europe. And that was very contrary to how they reacted to NATO enlargement of the same countries, or some of the same countries. One of the reasons for that was that they underestimated the security dimension of EU membership. So the security that comes with being part of the European Union. And the last and, and very recent one is Iran. We negotiated um, a nuclear agreement at the time uh, between the EU plus three, UK, uh, Germany, France, European Union, the US, uh, Russia, and China. And that agreement was about addressing a clear and present danger of an Iran armed with nuclear weapons. This, this agreement was a non-military diplomatic solution to one of the most pressing non-proliferation challenges. Now, the EU's concerns about the US shift and policy shift when they uh, unilaterally left this agreement was not about lost market opportunities in Iran. They are about our concerns about a potential of a return to nuclear arms race with destabilizing consequences for the Middle East. And that was also one of the reasons why the Australian government, uh, after an internal evaluation came to the conclusion to continue to endorse uh, support for the Iran agreement um, a few months ago. 
So political and economic issues will also be at the center of the upcoming EU Parliament elections that will start, in fact, on Thursday for four days, one of the largest democratic elections worldwide. We'll elect 750 uh, MEPs to represent 500 million Europeans. And here's some interesting news for you. Some of you in this audience might, in fact, be eligible to vote. Um, and uh, uh, 20 out of our 28 member states do allow it for the expats or Australians with dual nationality to take part in that election. And I went around um, Australia with some of our colleagues to, to spread that news. So here's your task when you go back after this lecture. Do check if you're eligible and, and uh, be part of that election process. Now this brings me to my second point, the bilateral relationship with Australia. 2019, I think, will be a special year in the history of EU-Australia relations, a bit of a game changer. We are launching initi initiatives that will fundamentally upgrade the ties between the EU and Australia across the board. With the ratification of an EU-Australia framework agreement, the launch of free trade negotiations last year in June, and the Brussels Leadership Forum for Senior Stakeholders that uh, some of us here in this room attended, Price was there, and, and co-organized it, in fact, um, a, a very successful four days meeting with senior and emerging leaders to discuss all aspects of EU um, and Australia bilateral and multilateral cooperation. And I can tell you at, at political level, we have an unprecedented number of, of ministerial visits to Australia. And the next one, in fact, uh, next commissioner for the European Union Security Union uh, will come in June. Now, these, these ministerial contacts um, cover the whole gamut of, the, of cooperation from foreign security policy, trade, agriculture, development, Pacific issues, industrial policies. And it underlined our common vision as, as like-minded partner. It also underpinned the upward trajectory in our relationship. The framework agreement that I mentioned and being ratified by Australia last year provides a legal platform to cooperate closer on all, all matters that are of interest to us, from foreign policy to science and technology, climate change, energy, education and culture, just to mention a few. And we are implementing these provisions already. Uh, we have set up with DFAT a new instrument, the EU-Australia Joint Committee, to oversee progress in our cooperation and how we move forward. And the next meeting of that will take place in, in Brussels in two weeks' time, and I'm, I'm pleased to go and, and, and attend. Um, it will be also a sign that we align our policy on all major political challenges. Um, I just joined a dialogue in Canberra at senior level of our foreign services to review security challenges and our responses. Australia's foreign policy white paper, which had been published in December 2017, and the EU global strategy um, of the same period um, show similar assessment and outlook. And one of the most important things for us is um, to safeguard the international rules-based order. Now, here are some concrete outcomes. The, uh, Australia will deploy a civilian expert to EU-led crisis and response capacity bu uh, building missions in third countries. And so, for the first time, Australian personnel will join an EU-led peacekeeping mission in Iraq on, secu on security sector reform. We also cooperate on cybersecurity and transnational crime. And most people don't know, there's actually an Australian desk uh, in, in The Hague at Europol. Um, on counterterrorism, um, we work together on global coalition to fight Daesh, or the Islamic State as it's called. And we work together to promote peace and prosperity in Asia Pacific, and Australia joined a meeting of 50 um, European and Asian leaders, uh, called it ASA meeting in Brussels in, in, in October. Cooperation in the Pacific is important. Um, we had uh, a trilateral talk with New Zealand 
uh, and Australia on Pacific uh, issues in Wellington um, to address the challenges for island states in the South Pacific and coordinate our efforts there. And on human rights, we are a like-minded country. We work with Australian diplomats um, around the globe to promote and defend human rights. One of our recent examples is that, that we put forward a new project in the United Nations, an alliance to ban the trade of torture tools globally. But for many, the most important aspect of this is the free trade agreement. We started negotiations last June. We had already three sessions of our chief negotiators. And I can tell you when our team from Brussels comes, there are 40 experts. So there's a whole plane that comes down um, and, and lands in Canberra for a whole one week mission. Um, another three of these uh, negotiation sessions are already planned uh, for this year. And this shows the ambition that we have to move forward with this um, project. Um, it's one of the fastest rhythm of trade negotiation that I've seen, and I've been a trade negotiator at one stage. Um, but it also shows that we have the ambition to have a very comprehensive agreement, what we call a gold standard of free trade agreements with Australia. It's also the first time that we use a new instrument to hold these negotiations. It's a kind of a European fast-track approach, whereby at the end, the ratification process will be done by um, the EU member states, the, uh, by governments, and the European Parliament, but it does not have to go through ratification of all different individual parliaments of member states. One important aspect for us has always been that uh, this FTA has bilateral, uh, has bipartisan support here in Australia, uh, and also the backing of the newly elected uh, parliament um, after the elections, and for a good reason. Bilateral trade figures confirm the upward trend that uh, I spoke about. Australia market is, is important for us in the EU. It is our globally combined trade and services amongst the top 15 uh, global markets. Now, if you, if you put together trade in goods, which are close to 70 billion Australian dollars annually, and in services, um, where we've got the largest increase of roughly 30 uh, billion, and you'll see we have an annual trade of, of about 100 billion Australian dollars between EU and Australia. That means 275 million Australian dollars are traded every single day. That's quite impressive. And um, uh, that means that the FTA with the EU will also be um, the biggest FTA for Australia. Now, even following the departure of the United Kingdom, this will, these fundamentals will remain. The EU continues to be the second most important trading partner, the second most important investor in Australia with a stock of 600 billion Australian dollars, and it will offer access for Australian companies to the second largest consumer market in the world. Now, one of the aspects of this free trade agreement is also that we support the international uh, rules-based trading order. We are united in our efforts to preserve the global framework that is based on rules and international law and that protects the interests of all parties in an equal manner. Now, this system, this system um, was the reason for the unprecedented rise of global prosperity. It lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and it mitigated the risk of war and conflicts. Now, the Australia and the European Union have every interest in standing together in defense of these achievements. Now, to put EU global trade policy into perspective, Australia has a very proactive trade policy, and it salvaged, together with Japan and uh, Singapore, the TPP after the US withdrawal. The EU also uh, has been um, a very proactive actor in that field, and we signed last year the largest bilateral FTA ever concluded um, when it, uh, the FTA with uh, Japan became operational. Now, all, out of the four main economies of this world, US, EU, China, and Japan, that's the only agreement between two of them. And that covers about 28% of global GDP. 
Now, from Canada and Mexico to Asia Pacific, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, and others, we have finalized a whole range of agreements to form a ring of friends in support of an open trading system. We spoke about scientific cooperation, and uh, we have a, a program that's called Horizon 2020, um, Education Erasmus Program, and we signed agreements on scientific cooperation to facilitate the exchange of researchers. We did this last um, December between the European and the Australian Research Council. And one aspect that I always like to talk about and I find quite fascinating is space. And we have two satellite uh, programs, Galileo and Copernicus, that already deliver tangible benefits for Australians. Galileo is a global positioning system, a GPS, that um, for instance brings down emergency signaling from three hours to 10 minutes. And that can save lives if you think about emergency situation in the outback or on the sea. And if you uh, buy a next shiny European car, your Galileo GPS system will be automatically part of that. Copernicus is a satellite-based um, uh, Earth observation system that provides geodata free of charge. And uh, this is uh, processed in particular in emergency situations. So Australia activated uh, this emergency uh, system um, during this March, uh, when you had a flooding situation, Queensland and Townsville. And we did the same um, uh, for the Cyclone Debbie uh, here in New South Wales and Copernicus. Um, one of the importance of um, our satellite cooperation is that we have a tracking station in Australia, one of only three global tracking stations uh, north of um, uh, Perth. Um, and that is the one that monitors all rocket launches from uh, French Guiana uh, for the first time. And the European Space Agency will invest another 50 million euros to upgrade that system here. Now, after we've spoken about space, we return to Earth. And my last point is on Brexit. Now, Brexit, um, I think we, we introduce it by saying we regret it, but we respect it. And I, I met uh, Chief Negotiator Michel Barnier in his office three days before the launch of negotiations. And um, he had a clear mandate, and he said, we will embrace the challenge of, of Brexit. And we did this in two stages. Negotiate an agreement on withdrawal from the European Union, the article, famous Article 50 process. Um, and then to sign uh, a memorandum on the future relationship um, that basically gives a design about what we want to achieve in, that, uh, in the UK-EU relationship going forward. One of the main issues was to prevent a hard border in Ireland. Because after all, the UK and the European Union are guardians of the Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland. Now, this is our, our key interest and, of course, also to ring fence our single market. Now, an agreement between the UK and the EU was finally endorsed by both sides, but as you know, did not get a majority in the UK Parliament. Therefore, at the request of the uh, UK, the EU twice agreed to a prolongation of the withdrawal process, which is now until the 31st of October. Uh, this, this includes a flexibility clause that will allow the UK to leave at any moment in between once the agreement is endorsed. Now, this also led to the, to the situation that the UK participates now in the European Union elections. And we sometimes get the question, to, why is that necessary? In fact, on both sides, in the UK and in the European Union. Um, the reason for that is, is that European Union citizens have the right to be represented. And if the UK is a member state, then it has to elect parliamentary representatives for its citizens. Otherwise, all the decisions by the European Parliament can be legally challenged and will be challenged. And uh, these, these uh, decisions are quite important. They will elect the European President, the Commission President soon, and they will uh, endorse the budget. So we have a duty to safeguard the proper function of EU institutions and to avoid that we import legal uncertainty. 
Now, we are now in the process of defining a new relationship um, with the UK, uh, a different model, a balance of rights and obligations. And we wish to have the strongest possible uh, relationship. Um, the UK decided not to join the single market and customs union at this point in time, but um, we stand ready to be more ambitious um, in, that, in that relationship. Certainly, security will play a very important role. We need to continue to cooperate in various bodies, Europol and uh, European uh, peacekeeping missions, um, and that in the interest of our citizens. We have to work on counterterrorism, on organized crime, and on other challenges. Um, a no-deal Brexit would be extraordinarily disruptive. There is no such thing as a managed no-deal. There is no deal, and that is no deal. And no deal means unilateral decisions to mitigate damage, but they are based on individual unilateral interests. They are time-limited and limited in scope. Now, for many people, one of the interesting aspects is what is the impact on EU-Australia relations? Uh, in my view, it has been, in fact, a driver of that new relationship with Australia. Um, for many decades, and for very good reasons, uh, culturally, historically, legally, and economically, uh, the UK, and in particular London, had been the platform and the hub for U uh, Australia's interaction, both with the UK, but also uh, with continental Europe, and that includes Ireland. And that give, has given uh, the UK the unique position to offer its global network uh, uh, of Commonwealth countries um, a platform and a gateway to Europe. Now that, that relationship has been so important that it's overshadowed for a long period of time the dynamic relationship that developed in inter alia and during that period with the EU and its member states. So we had a situation whereby we had a bridge to London and that served also Australians' interest into Europe and that, that was a system that served us well. But in the future, we'll have to have a new, a new system. Um, basically a structure of two parallel tracks, two bridges. One, the traditional one to the UK, and a new one to Europe. And we are now building the stepping stones and the building stones for that with a framework agreement, with FTAs, with uh, bilateral agreements on scientific cooperation and others that I mentioned. Um, on FTAs, one of the impact will be that the, the free trade agreement with the European Union will only apply obviously to member states and it will apply to the UK as long as it is a member state uh, and, and from that moment onward it will have to then negotiate its own agreement with Australia. Let me conclude by saying 2000. 18 has seen the launch of the FTA and many other of these initiatives that I uh, talked about, they lay a foundation for a long-term close partnership. And they're built on common values and interests. Now, for the cineast amongst you, let me, let me uh, finish with a Casablanca moment. Now, you may, you may all, or some of you may, remember that famous final scene Humphrey Bogart is there together with the French police chief and they see this plane leaving. And the, the French policeman looks at him and says, this is the beginning of a wonderful friendship. That's how we see it. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. So, Dr. Pulch, thank you for a wonderful setting out of the history of the emergence of the European Union and the relationship it now has with Australia. In a moment, I'll turn to uh, questions from the audience. Um, your lecture, in lots of ways, was a, a rosy and very positive outlook, and we would probably expect nothing less. But can I pose um, a few challenges? Um, 
There is a, a line of thinking that would say the, for all of the strengths you described, the European Union has reached a set of institutional uh, size and complexity that makes it insufficiently nimble to face up against some of the challenges that it now has to, uh, that it now has to tackle and that its enlargement means that achieving kind of values alignment to deal with some of these has outmatched actually the challenges and some might point to um, things like the fact that Russia now outmatches uh, the, the EU um, significantly militarily, poses some significant challenges. You have an un, uh, hard to manage, some would argue unmanaged migration challenge, the rise of popularism, Turkey which you're on the verge of bringing into the Euro Union that's outside it and become, has become significantly more, uh, more militaristic. An economy that does okay but struggles against its actual productive uh, capacity. Um, and an observation that yes, the euro is still alive, um, but it's taken a staggering investment to make that work and some regional parts of Europe would say at great cost to them. Uh, all tackleable, but some would say European institutions struggling with the nimbleness to match up against those paces of change. And I'm, I'm wondering how you reflect on the fit of the institutions, the challenges you now face. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for that challenge. I, I think uh, you sort of took the opposite to the rosy picture here. Um, but um, let, let us let us take this one by one. Uh, let me st uh, start by Russia, since you mentioned that. I was dealing with Russian affairs for two years before I, I went to Singapore. Um, one thing that very few had expected is uh, that we stayed. Uh, European unity on Russian affairs, and that is not a given. Um, we now have a, a very long borderline, direct border with Russia, all, for, all the way from the Arctic Circle down to the Black Sea. And we stand in support of Ukraine. Uh, we continue to do so. We've introduced sanctions against Russia. They, they introduced counter sanctions. Um, but there was one clear point in our policy that we will not um, uh, agree or, or, or tolerate um, the annexation of Crimea. And, and that was uh, not an easy policy decision to make. It was easy on, on substance that we would not um, change, uh, accept um, uh, territorial changes uh, in Europe, uh, but to, to maintain that firmness in the face of, of Russia was an important step forward. We have that same issue now with China. Uh, we just had a, a uh, summit with China uh, in April in Brussels, and um, we've presented China uh, now um, with a new line, uh, which basically, um, I think, under, um, underlines our view that China is a great partner, but also a systemic challenge and a competitor. And that has shifted a bit the view that in the which we have, we have we're dealing with China. So indeed, around Europe, there are many crises. Um, very often, uh, the refugee crisis is seen as a European crisis, but in fact, it was a crisis in the country of the of um, the origin of those people. Those people went to Europe because Europe was prosperous and safe. We shouldn't forget that. Um, but we were unprepared to have that large number. I mean, any country would have been unprepared to have that large number. I'll give you just one example. There is a, um, a small town, uh, a Bavarian small town at the Austrian border, Rosenheim, that during the peak time of these uh, migration flows welcomed more refugees from Syria and Iraq than the entire US in one year. That was the massive challenge that we had to face. And, um, and of course it has repercussions. It had repercussions also in our political system and you quite rightly mentioned we see um, a rise of populism, um, both on the left but particularly on the right side of the political spectrum. And I think we'll see that reflected in the outcome of the next European Parliament elections. Now this is a shift to more nationalism that we've seen across the board, and I would, I would argue it hasn't even started in Europe, 
it has started elsewhere, but it, it will be felt in Europe. But at this point in time, again, European Union, and very often together with Australia, and with Japan, and a few others, are one of the few ones that are, that are left and stand up for international organizations, like the WTO for trade matters, uh, like international agreements, um, whether it's be on, on Iran um, or on climate change. Um, so we do feel that there is uh, an, an interest of countries and regions to work together for a greater good and, and not to give in to, to a, a nationalistic, we come first type of approach. On the euro. Now, the euro, um, what we call a euro crisis at the time, was actually a crisis of national debts, sovereign debts of a number of euro countries. And uh, that, um, because they were now members of the European Union, they couldn't react in the same way as they used to react uh, by creating more inflation uh, or, um, or measures of that sort. So they were within a, a system that was more stringent. Um, and the market reacted uh, to that by, by uh, changing the interest rates that you had to pay for bonds and, and uh, obligations between Germany on one side and then probably Greece on the outer other side. That was a very, very challenging moment. And if we would have reacted with we come first mode, the euro would not exist today. But as I, as I mentioned, um, politicians came to the conclusion that this is a political decision and we have to go through that. And they were prepared to put in a lot of money to save that system. Uh, because um, the, um, the implosion in some countries would still have been felt. Um, so we spared, I think, Europe a, a tremendous uh, political crisis situation uh, by, by keeping countries on the line. And now some of them are actually um, the fastest growing economies. Over the last few years, you've seen Ireland, you've seen Spain and Portugal, just to mention three of them, um, in succession being the fastest growing European economy. And uh, even Greece is, is doing fairly well for, for its standards. So across the board last year, we had gro uh, growth in all European member states. But it's true. Um, the, the global economy will have an impact on export-oriented economies like the European Union. And if there's a trade war between two big um, economic players, uh, everyone will feel that. So we will feel that as well. I think that covers most that of your covers points. It very huh? well, thank you. So, questions from the audience. Going up the back. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I learned so much about the European Union. And my question is about human rights. And Australia, as you know, is the only country um, in the wealthy, democratically elected country with no human rights. And in the past years, there have been five submissions to the International Criminal Court on our treatment of people who seek asylum and arrive by boat. And as you said, the crisis is of where these people are coming from. It, it shouldn't be a crisis for the country. So what can we do about human rights and asylum seekers and torture, basically, of asylum seekers in Australia? Well, to, to, be, to be brutally frank on this, yep. this is an issue that um, you may want to address to Australian counterparts. Um, uh, we have um, already in Europe um, uh, quite intensive debate how we handle um, th this situation. Um, now, on, on the European side, um, one of the things that uh, has become clear to us is we have to have a holistic approach. Um, if, if you want a situation whereby uh, refugees stay in the countries of origin, and if you talk to refugees, they don't like to leave their country. They are refugees for a reason. Um, you have to create circumstances 
that allows them to be there, to work peacefully and, and to have a family and, and to have a life um, in, in orderly circumstances. And that has, and then basically you have to um, address two root causes. One is the political one. So human rights in these countries do play a role in that, that context and that's why we were pursuing a proactive human rights policy at the international level. But also um, tensions between countries and there's obviously also an economic uh, aspect. And that's why we, for instance, have signed uh, a, um, an agreement with African countries to support the development of African economies. Um, there's more investment going to Africa, both public but also private. Uh, we have to create um, jobs and employment also in, 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 in Africa. We can't confront the refugee problem only when they're on our shores. We have to, to basically be proactive in the countries concerned. I think that's the holistic approach is, is a very important uh, point of our of our policy. And that's why I always think that um, if you look at security and um, budget expenditure for security, <coughs> you should also include budget for development. You should include budget also for diplomatic services. Uh, very often, if you have a hammer, all your problems look like a nail. But I think we should have more tools than that. Other questions in the front row here, and then come along. I want to follow up on a question that um, the Vice Chancellor asked. <clears throat> I look at, at Europe, and I think it would be difficult to not acknowledge the good that the European institutions have done, both for Europe and the rest of the world. But if they're to continue to be valuable, I suppose they have to continue. And Brexit is, and the removal of a major country from Europe, from the European institutions, is surely a failure in some way of the European design. And I noticed that the President of the Commission seemed to acknowledge a couple of weeks ago that he himself had failed, perhaps, in not taking a more active role in talking to the British people about the value of the institution. Um, but then I look around Europe and I see the AFD in Germany and Mr. Orban in Hungary, all of them attacking um, in some way the European project. Um, and it seems that the European project itself is not prepared to defend itself effectively. I mean, Australians have a long history of deriding our politicians. Um, perhaps Europeans do as well. But what is the response if the European project is to continue? I, yeah, I think this is a very um, interesting point that you raise. What is our new vision? Um, I mentioned some of the history of, of Europe um, for a reason that we have to sometimes look back at where we started. Um, and the, the outcome of the referendum in the UK was a wake-up call for many in Europe, but also for many European citizens. I remember I, I chair the, the round of European ambassadors uh, on a monthly basis and I was in Singapore at the time. Uh, when the result uh, was published, we had a meeting of the various EU ambassadors from member states. And the Swedish ambassador said, um, it's, by the way, it's quite interesting, the approval rates in Sweden of the European Union have gone up. And then every single one of them said in fact the same. And if you look at approval rates today and compare them with 2015 <coughs> and 2016 levels, you will see that in all European, in all European member states, you've got a higher approval rate um, for the European institutions, but at the same time, also a higher anxiety about the, the future of Europe. So we've got these, these both, both these elements. Um, the higher approval rate, I think, is based on the fact that we've taken the European project for granted for a long time. Many, many um, European citizens now want a system like that. They don't want to have uh, the introduction of borders and customs and controls and so on and so forth uh, in Europe anymore. But, at this, you know, but, but we have to, to make sure that we not only solve the issues of the 20th century, but we also solve the issues of the 21st century. 
So we have to create a new vision for a next generation of European, young Europeans. Um, what I think was interesting when you look at the referendum in the UK is that generally speaking in generational terms, the highest um, pro-remain uh, voice was the younger generation. The, the younger they were, the more pro-European they get. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why I mentioned the European elections and, and hope that everyone votes is um, the young generation didn't vote to the same in the same numbers and same percentage as older generations did. So they allowed others to, to decide about their future. And that is very sad. And that was the point that um, European Commission President Juncker said in his interview, one of the things that he regrets from his time is that he followed the advice of the then um, British Prime Minister Cameron who had asked him not to campaign. He asked him not to campaign. He felt that this would be counterproductive. And so what you saw in that campaign was um, it, it was the, the Remain voice was based on, fig, on facts and figures, not on emotions. And only after, these, after the result of the referendums, you suddenly see huge manifestations in London, other places with flags and, and families and, you know, it, it, the emotional part of it. Um, and I think that was a mistake, that uh, um, that, that part of a, of a European dimension and European project wasn't, wasn't introduced in that, in that campaign. So we have, to, we have to develop that vision. And, but clearly, our vision is the world isn't safer if it is a world based of national, on national interest only. Um, and uh, that only if, if countries continue to work together, uh, we can achieve this. Eastern European countries are now part of the European family is not a given. We could have had many Belorussias in Europe, many Belorussias, but we did not. We have only one. Um, all the others turned around, transformed their societies, became part of it. Um, but it is a continuous, a continuous struggle. Thank you. There's a question also in the front row. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Poch and Ms. Black. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Poch just mentioned that um, so, so mainland China is both uh, a, a great partner and a challenge. So my question is, how do you look at the One Belt, One Road initiative from uh, mainland Chinese government? Thank you very much. Now, the interesting thing about the One Belt, One Road, if, if you look at that, is that it all starts in Beijing, but it all ends in Europe. So um, whether you, you take the, the belt or the road part of it. Um, and, and that means it is, is a project that um, ensures that there is a, is a uh, connectivity between China and the European continent. Um, and, and that is a project that, uh, in principle, we support. What we need to discuss with our Chinese partners, and what we do is, um, this has to be a two-way street. Two-way street, both in terms of the goods that are transported from one part of the world to the other. You can't have a system whereby uh, the trains are full when they arrive and they're empty when they go back. Um, it also has to be transparent in the way that um, uh, this initiative is, um, is moving forward um, in a transparent way that uh, also includes the wishes of the countries that are part of that initiative. Um, but in principle, to have a, a close connection that links Europe, uh, Western Europe, with Central Asia uh, and China, ultimately, um, uh, is a project that, uh, that we can support. We have time for a last couple of questions. If there are any there? Well, well we're perhaps looking for one. Uh, uh, perhaps a little conspicuous by its absence tonight was mention of the United States. Um, 
how is the European Union thinking into that complexity? Complex. <laughs> now, I think we have to start with, with one um, very, very clear um, starting point, and that is the European Union as it exists would not have existed or would not exist today without the support of the United States. The United States was the um, security guarantee um, for Europe during the development and during the Cold War period. Um, we would not exist as we do without that military umbrella of the United States, but also the support for the European Union at the outset as a, as a community. Sir James Plimsoll served in Brussels during the time of the European Economic Community, as it was called then, uh, much smaller. Um, and it was uh, US President Reagan who made that, firm, uh, that famous speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. Um, so um, it is our closest partner. That does not mean that we agree with everything that the US has done or, or does. Um, and there are clearly, um, at this point in time, areas where we would have hoped for a different response. We would have hoped that um, the US sees its own interest in maintaining um, uh, its position on international and multilateral agreements that were, in fact, finalized with a big push of the US administration at the time. The climate change agreement in Paris would not have been possible without the US and China basically agreeing on large parts of cooperation and moving that forward. The Iran, Iran agreement would not have happened without the Obama administration being a key a driver of that process. And you can name quite a number of others. Um, that we have a, an active international human rights policy is due to the fact that human rights were supported by the US administration for decades. Um, so um, the transatlantic relations are a founding pillar of, of the European Union and, and for our member states. Um, but we are, as many countries, we're going through a period um, where some of these foundations aren't as um, I would say, as supported or seem to be as supported as they used to be in the past, and I would like to, to go back to that relationship that we have so far. Well, that's probably the point where I might invite Harriet Bailey, the DFAT senior representative in the state, to offer a vote of thanks. We've had quite a journey tonight. Um, uh, Dr. Fulch has taken, on, uh, uh, taken us on a, a quite an extensive journey. Um, I'm I'm only going to recap a, a little bit of that journey and highlight perhaps where we are headed. Um, Dr. Fulch, you've mentioned all of our very strong linkages that Australia has with, with um, the EU, uh, whether it's security, whether it's our interest in peace and the continuation of the rules-based order in the world and our common aims in ensuring that they, they do continue, our mutual interests in our trade and investment relationship, the two-way, the benefits that we have there, Perhaps also importantly for the Tasmanian community, our growing and strengthening relationship in relation to Antarctica and science linkages. Now, um, these are all f absolute fundamentals for an excellent relationship and um, we can see it going forward uh, in, in leaps and bounds. Um, very importantly also this week, our cultural linkages with the EU were shown in our active participation of Eurovision and those cultural linkages I think are also a very crucial thing, the familial linkages that many, many Australian families still have um, with their EU, uh, with EU countries. So um, I'd really like to thank Dr Pulch for, for sharing his insights into um, the existing relationship and where we're headed. Uh, the Australian government's very pleased to be working with the EU on our common aims um, and we really look forward to continuing that. Um, and I'd just like to uh, give um, Dr Pulch a little thank you, a little something of Tasmania to take home for him. Perhaps also he could come back with his wife and bring his vintage convertible and enjoy some of the wonderful roads, travel round 
um, Tasmania. So thank you very much. Please help me in welcoming and, and thanking Dr. Pulch. And thank you all very much for coming.